When you talk about teaching people how to think mathematically, what does that look like? How does a person who thinks mathematically differ from a person who does not think mathematically? In almost every respect, for example, we don't get nervous when numbers are banded around. Uh, we know what the numbers mean. We know that if the prices go up 10% this week and come down 10% next week, they don't go back to where they were. We just have this sense of what the numbers mean. And what video games are ideal for, you can use them for doing all kinds of mathematics, but what they're ideal for is getting people to that familiarity with numbers and quantities that are really part and parcel of being a citizen in the 21st century in a country like the United States. So we're getting away from the traditional rote learning where you just oh. memorize everything whether you really understand it or not. Yeah, mathematics, today more than at any time in history, it's important to be able to think like a mathematician. You actually no longer need to do a lot of the detailed mathematics. We have machines like this device like that Peter's got next to me that will do mathematics for us. We have computers to do that. We have checkout machines at the, at the supermarket. Doing the calculations is not as important as it was when I was a child, but thinking mathematically, that's the coin of the realm in the 21st century. Well, I think the students of the future will be very happy to learn that they'll be able to spend their math class playing video games. I would hope they would, because learning math should be fun, and by golly, we can make it fun. Now, you're working on this project. Where is this project? Is this game ready to roll off the shelves? Absolutely. No, we, 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 we started off five years ago thinking that this might cost 30, 40, 50 million dollars my current estimate is this is a $500 million operation at least. I'm now calling this the Apollo program in mathematics education. It's the educational equivalent of putting some person on the moon. We want to put some person into a mathematical mind and, and, keep, and keep them alive if you want. So it's got to be a big national program. This is not something that even a large video game company can do. This has to be a national initiative because that's the only way to do something on this scale. Now that's very interesting because you're talking about a $500 million expenditure to build this video program. Now Sal, uh, you've created Khan Academy, which essentially provides free education, which costs next to nothing to produce, and you've had 16 million viewers already. But what is Khan Academy actually, and how does it really work? Yeah, so, so most people know it as this library of 1,400 videos on YouTube, and as you mentioned, it's got 16 million views. It's now the most viewed uh, open education library more than, uh, especially on YouTube, more than MIT and Stanford. And, and all of the videos have been made by me. I'm the faculty of the Khan Academy. And uh, the goal is to, you know, I, I'm going to keep making videos, but we're supplementing that with a software piece and eventually build a community around the site so that students can start teaching each other. And the goal is really to uh, to be a free virtual school for the world, a place where anyone can go to the site and learn at their own pace, get feedback, get data on what they're doing, and uh, start at any point and get to any point. If you go to the site right now, you'll see there's a video literally on 1 plus 1 equals 2. That's the very first arithmetic video. And the videos, you know, 1,400 videos is a lot of material. It goes all the way up to, uh, you know, the last calculus video I did was a, a surface integral, and you can go into differential equations and, and, and physics, and there's even stuff on the financial crisis and all of that. So the, the goal is to start at a basic level and go as far as you need to go. Now, before we discuss Khan Academy further, we're actually going to view some excerpts from some of your videos. So what are we going to see in these excerpts? Yeah, I, the one thing that I, I think stands out to a lot of people is that the form factor for the Khan Academy is fairly different than what you would expect as online video. You're not going to see the instructor. You're not going to see someone at a whiteboard kind of teaching uh, away from you. Uh, all you see is a black background, uh, some writing in different colors that look nice, and uh, a voice. And, and I like to end the voice as this voice. And uh, I, I like to think that it's kind of, it, it's more of an experience of me sitting next to you and, and we're doing a tutoring session or me being in your head. <laughs> and and, uh, and, and it, more of an intimate kind of one-on-one -on -one tutoring informal type of uh, framework, I think. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and roll that video. Let's take a look at Sal's video and then we'll come back and discuss it further. Let's roll that tape. So notice, we interpreted the statement in two different ways. This was just straight left to right, doing the addition, then the multiplication. This way, we did the multiplication first, then the addition. We got two different answers. And that's just not cool in mathematics. If, so, if this was part of uh, some uh, effort to send something to the moon because two people interpreted it a different way, or not, one computer interpreted one way, and another computer interpreted another way, the, the satellite might go to Mars. So this is just completely unacceptable. And that's why we have to have an agreed upon order of operations, an agreed upon way to interpret this statement. So the agreed upon order of operations 
is to do parentheses first. Let me write it over here. Parentheses, parentheses first. Then do exponents. If you don't know what exponents are, don't worry about it right now. Exponents. And in this video, we're not going to have any exponents in our examples. So you don't really have to worry about them for this video. Then you do multiplication. I'll just write mult, short for multiplication. Then you do multiplication and division next. They kind of have the same level of priority. And then finally, you do addition and subtraction. Finally, you do addition and subtraction. A neuron could be you know, a reasonably normal sized cell, although there is a huge range. But the axons can be quite long. They could be short. Sometimes in the brain, you might have very small axons. But you might have axons that go down the spinal column or that go along one of your limbs. Or you know, if we're talking about a dinosaur, go along one of a dinosaur's limbs. So the axon can actually stretch several feet. Not all neurons' axons are several feet, but they could be. And this is really where a lot of the, uh, the distance of the signal gets traveled. So let me draw. The axon. So the axon will look something like this. And at the end, it ends at the axon terminal, where it can connect to other dendrites or maybe to other types of tissue or muscle if the point of this neuron is to tell a muscle to do something. So let's say I go to the local grocery store. Let me draw that in orange. So let's say I go to some grocery store over here. I'll say G for grocery. And I buy $100 worth of groceries. And I want to pay with my newly issued credit card. Let me write this down. This is the issuing issuer. This is the issuing bank. I go to the grocery store. I say, hey, I'd like to pay with a credit card. The grocery store, if they accept credit cards, they need to have some relationship with another bank someplace on this Visa network in order for them to accept a Visa card. So let's say that they have a relationship with bank B over here. This would be the merchant bank, or we could say the retailer's bank. Or it's often in credit card lingo called the acquiring bank or the acquirer. And you might wonder, why is it called the acquirer? It's called the acquirer because this is the player that goes out and goes to each of the merchants and says, hey, right now you only accept cash or you only accept American Express. Wouldn't it be great if you also accepted Visa or MasterCard? That way, you'll have a, a more appeal to more customers. And you know, every time it, and it'll be more convenient for your customers. And every time a transaction happens, we'll just take a little bit of a, a cut of that transaction. And so they go out and acquire different retailers.